to get us kind of hyped about our spring migrants. We have Louis Bevier here today, and he is a research associate in the Department of Biology at Colby College. He's been a tour guide with Field Guides, an editor for the Birds of North America series, associate editor of the journal North American Birds, and he's been the past chair of the Maine Bird Records Committee. And on a personal note, he helped a group of us that I was part of identify New Hampshire's first record of cats and sparrow on Star Island. So we couldn't have done it without him. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you. Gonna yeah. close out this little yeah. message. It's a message. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks, Julia. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. I know it still would be nice to be out there birding. So um, the talk tonight is entitled Rare Birds of Maine. So I'm going to be talking about what rare birds are, uh, what causes them to move in the way they do and show up as rare. Uh, and how we document those sorts of sightings. Um, I'm not talking about rare populations, endangered populations, things like that. That's another talk. Um, but first of all, I know there's a lot of experts in this audience and to get us all started, I've got a little quiz. <laughs> so it's audience participation. I'm sorry, Zoom, but <laughs> maybe they can get on the chat. So here we go. And this is the quiz is, Bird or not bird? Springtime. Right? Any any guesses? Like a American toad kind of thing. Yeah. So that's not bird, right? <laughs> okay, it's pretty easy. There's two answers, bird, not bird. But anybody else want to go? We have lots of people. We have not bird. Frog. Not bird going once. Not bird. Not bird. Bird. Oh. And it's a white breasted <laughs> tapaculo from southeast Brazil. Oh. I've actually had not this bird, but I've I've had this. It's a small tapaculo subossine. It's about this big, uh, like our winter wren, a little stouter, but uh, walks around on the forest floor. And I actually had one walk over my boot when I was uh, there looking around. And uh, uh, the map shows you the distribution, but it's it's basically the Mata Atlantica, southeastern Brazil, uh, southeast and South America. All right, now you, you're good. <laughs> that was an easy. That was an easy one. <laughs> Lots of bird partridges. Okay, they, no use of Merlin, by the way. You can't <laughs> use that. Well, or, anyway, we've got not for bird an audience here. It's bird. <laughs> this is a big katinga, a capuchin bird, uh, northern South America, the Amazonian rainforest, the Gyan and Shield. Uh, I saw this bird, not this bird, but the species in Guyana. I was there in December. I'd been there working at the Academy of Natural Sciences uh, in the 90s, went down collecting along the Iwakrama in the Iwakrama forest, which is a, a sustainable forest reserve in Guyana. Uh, and these occur there. So pretty wild bird. Uh, all right, got you now. <laughs> Remember, it's bird or not bird. Bird or not bird. 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 What's 
Zoom saying. Zoom says bird. Bird. All right, we'll move along. Not bird. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, a lot of these insects uh, thrum on branches uh, and they make these sounds. So these recordings are made by putting a microphone on the stems of leaves. Three humped tree hopper here. Wow. And you can see it's Central American and Northwestern South American distribution. Pretty amazing. So you're doing all right, I guess. <laughs> well, I just, we're going to be talking about birds. So I want to make sure you're all ready to identify birds. All right, you got, there's a few more. Not bird. Not bird. Not bird. Good. Not bird. It's a jaguar. That's the jaguar call in the rainforest. If you hear that, I've heard that at night, and it's uh, kind of scares you a little bit when you hear it at night. Good going. All right. couldn't have been cho choosing these specifically to trip you up. I am teaching ornithology this spring with my wife and so they, they're going to get this exam afterwards. You know, it, how, what have you learned? It's a great bird found mainly, mainly in southeast uh, Brazil uh, but then a few places in the northwest of South America. Uh, all right, one more here. Yeah. Eddie saying bird. <laughs> That's very good. It oh, is a bird. Oh. It's a black and gold katinga. I'm choosing a lot of birds where I really, one of my favorite places in the world, the Atlantic forest of Southeast Brazil. And this truly is, it's a bird in the montane forest of the Mata Atlantica, which is now only about 2% of uh, what it once was. And this bird is called the saudade in uh, Portuguese, just meaning longing or sad. And when you're out there in the forest and the mountains hearing this, it's, it's just ethereal. You can't tell where they are and it's longing sort of sound. All right. Not getting a lot of audience participation. Come on. Not bird. Not bird. Okay, not bird is correct. The Franquette's epileptic fruit bat. All right, well done. Okay, now you're all primed to know what birds and not birds are. And we can get on with the talk. Um, just had to get y'all. One moment, I think the display is getting cut off. I'm just gonna, sorry, everybody. I no just problem. need to adjust some. Display settings here. Oops, sorry. For the Zoom. Yeah. I think. One moment. This might be, I know it looks kind of funny, but no, I think this okay. might be the only way to make sure Zoom sees it all. Okay, that fixed it. Very good. Thank you. And now I hide this thing up here. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think we're up there. Okay. Okay, very good. All right. Well, now we're on to the main part of the talk. Um, and hopefully it won't bore you. There's a lot of photographs in here of rarities, but there's so many to cover for Maine. Uh, as you'll discover in the talk, if you don't already know, Maine is a 
excellent place for rare birds. Um, and I thought I had to start off here with a familiar bird that was kind of the highlight rarity for Maine for a long time before the stellar sea eagle showed up. And that was the tropic bird that was resonant out in the Gulf of Maine uh, from 2005 to 2000, I think yeah, 21. So 17 years in a row, pretty, pretty cool bird. So there's a photo of it from 2012. So what are rare birds? Uh, and for this evening talk, and what, when we talk about rare birds, we're talking about vagrants here again. Um, and I'll talk about what vagrants might be and how, what classes of vagrants there are. Then I'll talk about how we get these reported. It's changed a lot. Um, but alerts now include all these disparate uh, reporting apps. Uh, but then from that point, you'd get documentation. You can see in the lower right there is documentation from uh, Mark Libby of his yellow-nosed albatross that he saw offshore when he was out fishing. Um, and then the usefulness of this is long-term data and population trends can be determined from some of these things and just what the historical uh, status of birds in a particular region. And then last, I'll go through some reasons and patterns for vagrancy. So again, not uh, endangered and threatened species, uh, although those are highly important here in Maine as elsewhere. And I've highlighted a few of those uh, from the tropics. Um, what I'm gonna talk about are vagrants. And these are birds that are lost in migration and they're either storm-driven, misoriented, or other causes. But there are also um, ecological reasons and benefits for some of this. Uh, birds have to move if their habitat is destroyed. So there's some part of their uh, life history that has them move. So that, that's an aspect of what brings vagrants. I go over the ones that are forever gone. Um, and those are for Maine, Labrador duck, passenger pigeon, Eskimo curlew, and the great auk. Um, we don't actually have any specimen evidence for Labrador duck or even written documentation of it in Maine, uh, although it was collected at Grand Manan Island, so that's close enough. <laughs> but uh, we still technically within the confines know. Uh, passenger pigeon was here quite a bit. We have quite a bit of evidence for the auk too. I thought I'd throw up this up as the Eskimo curlew. In fall, uh, they were a, a regular migrant through the blueberry fields, the way Wimbrel are. Uh, they would stop by and then their way south to South America, wintering in Argentina. So these are the birds. This was long kept as not extinct. Uh, and we hope springs eternal for this bird and others like it's slender bill curlew. But uh, probably gone. Now, rare is relative too. And here's a clipping from uh, Palmer's 1949 Birds of Maine, where he's telling us that uh, the Northern Cardinal or Eastern Cardinal here, <clears throat> they are different from Arizona birds. <clears throat> Very rare visitant. Most records referring to escaped captives. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of changes have occurred, and cardinal is part of this Carolinian avifauna that's so-called that has been spreading north, especially since the 40s, 50s, and accelerating into the 60s and 80s. That includes, anybody know what another one is? The red-bellied woodpecker, amazing. Carolina, Carolina, Carolina Wren. Tufted Timmouse. Tufted you got you. You're hitting all of them. Um, when I moved to Connecticut in the, in the late 80s, mid late 80s, red-bellied woodpecker was uncommon and scarce. And I don't know how many breeding records we had. I worked on the breeding bird atlas for Connecticut. And now it's one of the commonest birds. And now black vulture is as common as turkey vulture there. And so turkey vulture is another one that started to move north, uh, but it's not quite the same as that. There, I said I wasn't going to talk about rare and endangered species, but grasshopper sparrow is certainly one of those in Maine, uh, highly restricted. You're going to take a trip to Kennebunk Plains where they occur. Um, and there are a few other locations with the right habitat for that. Um, 
they were often found around airport grasslands in Connecticut. I'm not sure that they're still extant there. All right, so we'll move on to some vagrants. I'll show you some pictures of vagrants just to remind you of some of the great birds that we've had in Maine. Um, this one was close to home, uh, about 15 minutes away from my house. Trevor Persons found in one of the most unlikeliest of spots in a quarry, uh, sand quarry, uh, Smith's Longspur. This was the second state record. There's an older one. Uh, and same for Trestnut called Longspur. This is an example of getting reported in the modern method of somebody, I think, walked out and put it, this, I'm not sure, totally sure it was like, what's this bird on Facebook or something like that. But it uh, gradually got out that there was this chestnut collared longspur out at East Point in Bitterford. Um, it was a bit ragged, but a pretty spectacular looking chestnut collared longspur. On the lesser end of rarities is, I'm just throwing in nice photos, lark bunting. This was at Seal Cove in 2015 on, uh, the Acadia Bird Festival trip. Uh, and this bird used to be a little bit more regular as a, a stray or casual rarity in the Maine, uh, maybe once, twice in New England, but uh, has since um, really become quite rare. Then there's some truly exceptional rarities. This one was uh, offshore in the Gulf of Maine, a white-chinned petrel, which is a bird of the South Pacific, and you wouldn't expect it in the North Atlantic. <laughs> so, um, this is part, I think this year they were doing a survey uh, offshore, and Zach Cliver's there. He's the naturalist you often hear on the Bill Watch trips out of Bar Harbor. But not all rarities or vagrants are um, species or thought to be species, they could be split out. The fox sparrow has at times had different subspecies split as species and could date someday. So one of the real rarities on the right there is a sooty fox sparrow from New Hampshire. And above that is a Western race of our familiar red fox sparrow, but that one occurred in Connecticut. So if you keep your eyes sharp and learn some of the geographic variation of birds, that's worth keeping a mind of. There's I threw in the side of one of the great examples of geographic variation in North America is the dark-eyed junco. And here, a lot of these were separated as separate species. There's also the separate yellow-eyed junco here already, but white-winged junco on the far right there. And you can see in the middle of the country, the Black Hills, pretty distinct from any others, uh, doesn't really hybridize. Um, the only records we have here are from the northernmost breeding Western birds, Oregon junco. Uh, and there are a few good records of that for Maine. Um, there are quite a few reports of pink-sided junco, but I think they're probably not that. And it is difficult. There's a lot of our slate colored juncos get this uh, reddish cast to them and immatures and it's a problem, but thought I'd throw in, keep our eye out on juncos. And then there's some really uh, distinctive subspecies that are extremely rare. Uh, on the upper left is a great white heron. Um, this has been proposed as a separate species. Uh, it occurs in the, the Florida Keys and across the Caribbean and around Cuba. Um, it's strictly coastal marsh. How there's actually several records of birds that fit this. They're not any, so far as we know, uh, white more of great blue heron, but that would be a question, and it was a question in this, but the genetics just don't prove that out. In fact, the genetics prove that there are great things, distinct entities called great white herons. And there's a number of records of these dispersing in the same pattern one would expect for birds like roseate spoonbill, uh, which has occurred in Maine even. On the upper right is something we don't think about, why we flag Dunlin in uh, summer. This is an Arctica Greenland breeding Dunlin. It's barely larger than the semi-palmated sandpiper uh, to its left there. Um, and this is one of just a couple of records for North America of that. And then the bottom is a distinctive race of Wimbrel, uh, the European. There's 
a Eurasian group all have white rumps like this. This one we figured out was actually of the European group. So, that's a question. Yeah. The, the great white heron, how it was disproved that it could be like a leucistic great blue heron? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Leucism occurs in or albinism or something, you know, whatever you, yeah. term you call that. But all the soft part colors in this bird were the same mm -hmm. as they occur in, in a great white heron. Um, and the, the plumage was of the same uh, color cast of white. So it wasn't like an abnormal loss of melanin or some other sorts of thing. So it's a good question and it is difficult. There are some minor differences in size and the laurel coloration, but uh, anyway, we've, we've determined that. There are some other records we haven't reviewed of that. So uh, site reports. Uh, a lot of you're out birding and you'll email friends. Email seems like the slow way. Now there's these different apps um, and even the main birds Google group when I wrote this for 27 years ago was uh, is not being used that much. eBird is being used quite a bit now. Um, and a lot of people track what other birds are found on eBird and you can get a what's called a rare bird alert there. They aren't all rare birds and I, uh, I think I talked about that later, that sometimes we have to flag things that we are out of season and just to make sure that they're being reported or things like fish pro, which are very localized, purple martins, only a few colonies, least terns. You know, we don't want our filter regions are broad, like whole counties or groups of counties. Social media, although we've had some great finds from them, it's a poor archive. Um, mm -hmm. My main interest is the archival part of this. So making sure we get everything for the future. I've looked at old records 100, 200 years ago, and it's so difficult to see that we're missing things that just disappeared, specimens get lost. So archiving is important to me. Documentation, uh, I really encourage the students I teach to keep close looking, describing what you see, um, one of the, the common things I find is that people will uh, identify the bird and then attribute characters to that species they know it is. Uh, so you got to try to avoid that when you're, and then there's some long-term data places here. I wanted to just bring up some of the history of this and really before the early 1900s, shotgun birding was the way it was done. And they were collecting and it was a uh, impetus of some of the Connecticut uh, people in starting at Audubon and Citizen Bird here. Mabel Osgood Wright was one who encouraged people to identify and document birds by sight. Um, and Rita Saunders was another one also Connecticut wrote some books on uh, identifying birds and getting people out looking at birds without just shooting them to see what they were. He also has a really good ear and has a, a beautiful book describing the songs and calls of birds uh, descriptively. So notes, documentation. Well, here's, I pull up some of mine. Here's uh, some notes I took on 1968. People who are old enough know what a mimeograph is, but that purple sort of ink is on up there. Um, uh, but, on the right-hand side are some of my early written notes. Um, my friend at the time, Bruce Boitler, uh, well, he went on and has earned a Nobel Prize so, uh, in genetics and <laughs> medicine. So not me so much, but we're good pals and we still go birding some. Uh, then I get a little more advanced. I start following the, the Grinnell format on the upper left where I'm really trying to describe and remember what the conditions were, who was with me, what the time I spent, where I went. And surprising, eBird is useful, but that top part is omitted by a lot of people. Some of the best keep track of that, but you'd surprise, you know, like a week later, you can't remember what the wind direction was or the temperature or how long you really spent. So start and stop time, not just eBird start time and duration, important. And then just written notes. Uh, so a species account on the bottom right there, Polynesian tattler, that's now known as gray-tailed tattler. That was in uh, California in 1981. 
they've since had a record uh, out there that everybody caught up that one. And we even have a record from Maine. Thought I'd just show you some of my older times here. I used to be a naturalist in the Sierra Nevada, sort of home state to me is California. And the upper right is um, birding with some people who are still very active in uh, rarities and birding and one who's passed away. Uh, the man on the left carrying the scope is Fred Purnell and he's sitting with me and he's passed away. He taught philosophy at Queens College in New York. And there's Paul Lehman in the blue shirt and in the white shirt is uh, Tom Burke from New York, long time rare records uh, member there and uh, the voice of the rare bird alert in New York City. <laughs> and then uh, I'm there on the right in those. And for the younger in the audience, that's, yeah, that's just cheap rum in Venezuela and the, pep <laughs> the Pepsi's just didn't taste right without it. So. Um, so open up your field guides. There's this important page. This I think came out of Sibley, uh, one of Sibley, David Sibley's books, but learn these parts of a bird. It's very important to communicate what you're seeing. And the more you do this and sit down and do this, the more information you'll gather faster. When you see something briefly, you'll remember and you'll be more neutral and objective about what you're describing. Uh, as long as you go through this systematically, uh, on a regular basis. Um, it's important to use and listen for sounds like we just played, <laughs> bird, not bird, um, and describing those sounds with words that mean something to somebody else. Uh, Nathan Peoplo has a good uh, book out on that. So there's acoustic and vocalizations that birds make uh, mechanical sounds. The woodcock makes both mechanical and vocal sounds. Uh, rough grouse has a mechanical sound. Uh, drumming of the wings. Woodpeckers, of course, mechanical sounds. Lots of those come up. Morning dove, the flight whistle of the wings, mechanical sound. So learning where the feathers lie in a bird. I always like to encourage people to learn how feathers and what those patterns uh, how those patterns form by the feathers that uh, are colored by them. So this is just another way of describing, describing, you know, here's the sonogram. And then you can now look at sonograms quite readily with the uh, Merlin app or checking out Macaulay online or Xenocanto. Um, so two chips and a trill at same pitch, you know, the, the trill could be dis descending, it could be ascending. It could be decelerating, you know, getting slower, all sorts of things that you would hear just naturally, but you wouldn't think to describe. So it might even help to even draw what uh, you think you hear. So I'll, I go over all this because it's a strong part of what I do in the records committee, and that's practice taking care of your notes. Um, and there are some things to be aware of. Uh, perceptual and cognitive fallibility. So you see colors. There was a report of a yellow-billed loon that we recently reviewed. It was early morning light, and it was in late summer, and the common loon was shedding its ramphotheca, which is the horny covering the bill, and it looked pale or yellowish in that light to this observer. And even the photographs give it this kind of ochre color, but it's not the same color as the yellow-billed loon, and the, the plumage pattern was wrong but you could see how this comes in. So knowing color casts and background colors and how that changes it. Um, the sharing information freely, we do that pretty well right now. Um, and then the bottom part is just so I don't get yelled at. I do evaluate things dispassionately. <laughs> and I'll let you know what I'm thinking if it, I wanna know what something really is. So part of the long-term data, we keep we have a records committee with an archive of photographs, some of which all and now a lot of digital evidence that's stored here, photographs of specimens. Um, we go back through publications um, and the museum specimens, the main state museum is now one of the better places for things here, but Museum of Comparative Zoology, Harvard, uh, UMaine Orono has some. Uh, and there are several small collections with interesting birds. But keeping your photographs and field notes and archiving those, planning ahead, that's something I encourage everybody to do. 
So why is all this so fun? So what are rare birds and what are, what are people doing? Well, we keep individual state lists on our own or county lists or personal life lists. I thought I'd go over a few state regional political boundaries and how those lists have changed over time and accrued. Um, I came from California, so it was a big interest to me. Uh, Joe Gell published this graph here with a regression line and a growth curve of all this, of all the way up through 1980. Um, and at that time, uh, let's see, when he published that, it was 535 species in California. Now you can see at the top there are 681 species <laughs> that have occurred. And I went back uh, in 1922, Joseph Brunel, he wrote this apocryphal phrase here. It is only a matter of time, theoretically, until the list of California birds will be identical with that for North America as a whole. Um, of course, North America is increasing at, <laughs> too, but California is right up there at 3.2 species per year over that entire stretch. And by comparison, Here's Connecticut from 1913 to 1923 at only 1.2 species per year. And you can see some of the accumulation there. They're now up to 451 species recorded in the state of Connecticut. I always used to think it was sort of a black hole and there was missing good birds, but they're, fine. they're really finding some great stuff now. Um, the other thing I should mention is these, these numbers here are just rough calculations from the listed uh, numbers of species, there's lots of changes that could be made with uh, species taxonomy, and I haven't really covered that, but it's, it's a small change different. And so here's the main state list. And I started with um, uh, Ralph Palmer's book, 1949. We could go back further uh, and in time and look at the change there. But you can see we're at about 1.7 species per year from 1949 to 1923. And I've listed the, the totals there from the various um, publications. Palmer at 345, and that includes the extinct species. He did not, he has a summary table at the end. And then Peter Victory's a little booklet for Maine Audubon in 1978, 395, proudly 395. Well, we go on, then they had another book with uh, Jan Pearson and Liz Pearson, Peter, 421. And just last year, we crossed over four, to 470 in Maine. So quite an accomplishment there. All right, here's a long table of all the, a lot of the birds I won't show you tonight. But there's a lot of rarities in that, and it might be of interest to somebody and that's being recorded, I have, Maybe there's some errors here and there's some rough things that around the edges, but uh, you can see what's been added. In 22, we had broad-tailed hummingbird and Western marsh harrier, which a lot or Eurasian marsh harrier, uh, which a lot of you saw, I did not. Um, I was headed off to Australia, so I wasn't too sad. Um, 1920 and 2021, uh, Barolo Shearwater by Doug Gotchfield way out uh, the Northeast uh, Channel, uh, outer part of the Gulf of Maine, just almost really not Gulf of Maine. Mass booby, the boobies, the warm water species are showing up. I expect red-footed booby to show up. There's a record off Nova Scotia. We had stellar sea eagle, I'll talk about that. Red wing was long expected. Zoned owl hawk, and there's a theme here running of real rarities for hawks. Um, Anyway, you can vote on your favorite year here. 2018 was a great year, but uh, with the great black hawk, the roseate spoonbill with the hole in the bill that we tracked from uh, New York uh, north to Maine and then back down to Connecticut where it spent time. Um, Western wood peewee uh, out has been now a couple records of that. Gray flycatcher on Monhegan, uh, Luke Seitz playing his guitar inside, looked out and saw a bird wagging its tail downward in an imp head. And violet green swallow, um, can see some more. I, I know you're, you're, you promoted the Vermilion flycatcher, so we'll cover that. <laughs> Cassin's vireo was quite a tough debate. Idea of these vireos that are split from blue-headed vireo is a big difficulty. Um, but there was one on Monhegan 
Um, great knot, amazing bird. Ancient murrelet, the little, the wee craft as John Drury calls it out in the Gulf of Maine a couple of years. Um, anyway, you can read down and if there's anybody wants to ask about any one of these the records of when they showed up, but it's not too much of a surprise. We've got some things like Eurasian siskin, I'm not so sure. We'll they have to bronze cowbird, not that, that was a good one. Going back in time even further, Robbie Lambert found a European golden plover at Scarborough Marsh. Um, Trevor Persons found the Kirtland's warbler in Kennebunk Plains, and he had just a 50 millimeter slide <laughs> camera. And I got the slide and I captured, scanned it, and then blew it up. And we we're lo and behold able to really tell. So uh, that's on our website too. Green violet ear, amazing uh, hummingbird, but there's several records for oddball tropic, tropical hummingbirds. Um, and on uh, common ring plover, one of my claims of fame, I found that down in Lubeck. Uh, sleep, sleep back gull is another one that I found in Maine that's a first record. Um, Sage Thrasher is one I saw back in 2001 and everybody's seen since. Now on the right side of this list is something if you go to our website, which is at the bottom here, I have a link, the official list of Maine birds. Um, we've decided to mark off some of the birds that are historically reported and almost certainly are correct, but we don't have the specimen uh, or the photograph. So Stellar's Eider, they're is a mount at the Maine State Museum that could be that bird. Pacific Golden Plover was identified by one of the experts at the American Museum of Natural History, Jonathan Dwight, uh, but we've not located that specimen. Bartail Godwit, there might be a chance we'll come up with the photos of that, um, not found. Whitetail Topic Bird is a uh, hurricane uh, drift bird that we didn't we haven't since gotten, and we don't know where the specimen is. Lesser frigate bird was uh, taken, pictures are on movie film, and the movie film was sent to Alexander Wetmore at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC, and identified it as a lesser frigate bird. I'd really like to see that too. Then there's a list of birds I call unsubstantiated. So these are just reports of things that are um, we're not sure what's going on. The cinnamon teal was probably one, whether it was escape or not, we don't know. We don't have firm evidence of Labrador duck. Um, the heath hen, greater prairie chicken, probably did not occur in Maine, but it's not sure. black bill magpie, a Western bird, uh, but there are some vagrant records into the mid eastern part of the Midwest and further. We're not sure if those are escapes or not. Eurasian jackdaw was part of a big group of birds that invaded the Northeast. And we do have a, a written account from a fellow who saw that on Matenicus Rock. Um, but sadly, he doesn't actually describe the bird. He said, I looked in my field guide, and it was exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing that frustrates me. <laughs> probably, probably good. And then that, uh, there's an interesting, I saw a bird, one of these jackdaws in Connecticut, it had this kind of kilted damaged leg. And so I asked him, you know, did you notice an, you know, the left leg sticking out? He, he didn't even remember that, but spotted toe, he's been reported, Buick's friend been reported both on Mount Desert Island and just sketchy reports. We don't have firm evidence. And then I thought I'd list some of the other birds that are exotics. I think ringneck pheasants, what's on our state list now, might actually go down there because they are released by the more multi thousands, I think, every year. And uh, for a while, we, they, they, do, they do breed, um, and especially the islands. Matenicus is one place they stay in Monhegan. They were almost gone, and then somebody brought in a load more, unfortunately. Um, Chucker, you often see those, and monk parakeets used to be. Uh, up this far, up far north, but they're in Connecticut. I think the main wildlife people took the monk parakeet out. All right, so I've covered the historical archives and what those are. Uh, and one of the things we do with the records committee is publish a report. Um, we just, the annual report is out now in Bird Observer and it's on our website. You can download the PDF of that. <clears throat> 
And some of the evaluations that go on, this is older. Uh, Doug Hitchcock was doing a beach survey for beach dead birds and, um, oh, huh, and looked at this bird and then walked away and left it there. And it was a, he didn't know at the time until later realized that could have been a good bird, uh, Trindade petrel. So all we had <clears throat> were his, his hand and the photos of his hand with the bird. So I measured his inner digit space here <laughs> and got a reference for size and measured the tarsus and Coleman and eye bill distances. And we got some pretty strong evidence plus some of the plumage that is visible that it was this and not another similar species from the Pacific. This was expected actually. Whether it died in main waters, that is debatable, but it would be reported nowhere else. So we did, we're, we're claiming it. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some of the ways and that birds are, are um, uh, lost. And uh, they didn't tend to follow wind. So when the winds are in the right direction, they're not gonna fight it. Uh, and so those birds will follow those winds. There's some evidence that birds even crossing the Pacific, small passerines on these very fast winds uh, and getting over to North America, not around the top, but across the water. There's uh, aberrations like misorientation, uh, overshooting, summer tanager is a good example of that here, blue grosbeak. There's also this uh, term I came up with like habitat dispersalists, um, drought loss, um, birds have to move, their marsh is gone. Uh, rails or uh, rallids are a big part of that. And you can see that they can move. They don't seem like they're strong migrants, but they've occupied a lot of islands around the world and speciated on those islands too. And the last one is, um, and probably the most common vagrant uh, is from populations that are changing and, and growing. So I thought about raptors came up um, and how Maine has a, a number of really good records of raptors and they can go almost anywhere. Here, I thought I'd just show you an example. This is this far 22 South. They have these great uh, animations of uh, satellite track birds. So this is a pair of honey buzzards from, uh, I think it's uh, the Netherlands, and they fly to their winter grounds in Africa. And you just follow that here and <laughs> see the female is in the pink. So that's their foraging around the nest site in the Netherlands. Now it's fall migration, go across the Straits of Gibraltar, down through West Africa. She cuts across the desert, I think has a, uh, aim further south. She's now down south of Gabon. He stayed in West Africa. And heading back north over some pretty prohibitive landscapes here. That's just all desert. And she's headed back. Again, these are based on uh, actual data of the and then animated so we can see and then they they fill in the clouds and the landscapes so he gets back first it's typical for males to return first our red wing blackbirds return first males so now they're back on the back together and they've reestablished connection so raptors do have this ability to go long distance and they've got big wings and they're as long as they can find food so here's a list of some of the spectacular uh, raptors that we've had in Maine, Western Marsh area last year uh, as a Euro European bird, a little bit in Western Asia. Um, and there are a number of records in the Caribbean. I'll get to that. The stellar sea eagle, uh, we will all talk about that. The great black hawk we know of. Stone tail hawk was a one day wonder by one person. Crested Caracara uh, showed up in central Maine, uh, and I don't have photos of that, but I'll talk about it a little bit. So here's the great black hawk, and one of the things that we tried to do to know that these are the same individual, even as extreme as it is, uh, here it is in uh, a Deering Park, and then there's a photograph of the tail. So a couple of things we evaluate are 
uh, both is it the same individual and where did it come from? What population might it be from? Because there are great black hawks in South America and there's even the birds that we don't know, maybe they were escapes in the Florida area. Um, so that right-hand tail feather is clearly the, the second basic uh, molt under, uh, <clears throat> undergoing its molted that, but it's damaged and twisted. The pygostyle might have been damaged somehow, and it twisted that feather. Uh, the left-hand feathers are uh, juvenile feathers. And so we can tell somewhat that the subspecies of great black hawk is discernible from the tail pattern, but not in that uh, sub-adult plumage, even the black and white ones. Although I've been looking at specimens and friend John Schmidt has worked on that. Uh, it does look better for Ridgeway eye, which is the uh, Mexican Central American race of great black hawk. Other ways to match them are looking at feather patterns. If you look at the under tail uh, under wing coverts, the uh, the pale creamy feathers with black patterns on them, there's some identical feathers there. So others have done this. Tom Johnson. There's other people who compared them, and there's photo credits for uh, the. Observation. So Alex Lamero had this bird in South Texas, South Padre, and then it was showed up in Maine in August. I was in Mexico seeing great black hawks there, uh, and it stuck around. And we, we followed it until its demise, as you all know. All right, another feather pattern matching. Here's a case of this stellar sea eagle. How we know it's the same bird? Um, a number of the feather patterns in the wing, upper wing and on the underside, I'm not showing here, um, have been linked up uh, to document that it was the same bird as first seen inland in uh, Alaska in August of 2020. Then it moved to the Maritimes in the summer of 21 and then winter here. Um, there is some precedence for this bird. Uh, and there's a bird that returned for 16 summers in a row to Taku Inlet in Alaska near Juneau. Uh, and that bird uh, associated with a bald eagle and never I think were they, did they know that they nested, but there is a record of a bird on video that looks like a hybrid uh, stellar sea eagle, bald eagle that was found where you might presume they would winter in British Columbia. So there probably did get together. And so uh, that was one reason a lot of us predicted, yep, that this bird goes to their times, so it'll be back here. And sure enough, it was. It could do that for some time to come. Raptors long-lived and able to survive. So here's a video of our famous stellar sea eagle. This is at Booth Bay uh, through my telescope. You know, thousand, thousands of people have seen this I bird. I have not. I, yeah. Next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to go next year. It was minus 26. Oh. It wasn't too bad here, but I didn't go partly because of the crowds. I was not wanting to take. Well, then, so that's the stellar sea eagle, one of our most famous. Now, the current rarity, the uh, raptor rarity, is this Western Marsh Harrier. And on the left is the best photograph I could find. Uh, well, best comparative one here for this case of, of the bird at West Keg by Gary Jarvis. And you can look at the patterns of the white in the upper wing. And it matches the bird seen 11 weeks later in New Jersey. And it is molting. It, uh, you, the other unusual thing is the bird here in Maine was not a juvenile. All the other records, I think there's seven other records are across the Caribbean, Guadalupe, uh, Puerto Rico, Bermuda. They're all juvenile birds, which would all have a uniform tooth-like uh, primary structure, not these obvious molt limits and changes uh, older birds would get. get. Um, between Maine and the 11 weeks later, it's also getting dark streaks on the crown, which is typical of birds as they age, but you can still tell it's a young, an immature or subadult uh, female, the same as was here, 
but it still has a brown eye. It's an adult, if it were an adult Western Marsh Harrier, she would be getting a, a brighter gold eye. So that's how we track that. Um, six days after the last sighting of the bird in New Jersey, uh, there was a uh, bird strike on a United Airlines 737 landing at Newark Airport. And then uh, a person I know, Carla Dove at the Feather Identification Lab, they got what they called the snarg, which is just the smear <laughs> on the wing of the plane and a feather. So they got a feather and some DNA and they matched it up to uh, immature uh, Western Marsh area. So yeah, didn't make it. Some other vagrancy driven things can be wind and storms that cause a, a northward migration of Franklin skulls through the prairies. There was this interesting situation in 2015, late, and there were hundreds of Franklin skulls pushed eastward, uh, eastward of where they would. And you can see some of the weather patterns here that preceded that uh, invasion. This is the distribution of the Franklin skull. Most of them are wintering offshore, near shore in South America. They're migrating, migrating due north and across the Great Plains to uh, the Southern Prairie provinces. And here's a Franklin skull, part of that. Uh, invasion at Sebastopol Lake. Misorientation is another cause. Uh, we get birds that jump, uh, don't migrate in the same direction that they should. So here, fork-tailed flycatcher, it's a, a bird that breeds in Southern South America and in the Austral uh, fall migrates northward to Northern South America. Uh, some, some may overshoot and there may be some that are taking the opposite direction when they're from their winter grounds uh, and getting caught in storms. That seems to be what most of ours are. Uh, here's a bird in June uh, at Brunswick. Um, I talked about this uh, dispersal driven vagrancy. Um, here's a case of the purple gallinule in 2014. Uh, and here's an eBird map showing the distribution of the bird typically in, in, in the fall. And then during just preceding that was this buildup uh, in 2013 of severe drought in the Caribbean uh, and also in Southern Florida. So the marshes that this bird loves are now just dried up. And what is a bird to do, but got to get up and fly. Um, so when they do that, they get caught in these uh, weather streams and propelled vast distances all the way here in this case First records for Ireland and Portugal, I think, occurred during this invasion. Um, we had a few records too. Some of them were found long after the case. Uh, I think it was Rob Spears found this at Kettle Cove and he was just walking along the boardwalk and saw the dried mummified purple gallon hole. So we have that specimen to thank for that. Um, then there's the dispersal for burgeoning populations. And black-bellied whistling duck is one of those that's been increasing and increasing in the Southeast. Uh, used to be not so common now. And they, when they disperse, they disperse in flocks. So Camden was lucky to have the flock of 11 here. This one was part of a group of six. There's one died and we have the specimen of that at Colby. This is some documentation of this. There's a paper that looked at uh, range changes and population changes in birds in Eastern Asia, and then looking at records committees, records in Europe, and uh, there's a very good correlation between these range changes and vagrancy outside the normal range of the bird. Um, then we had to, a few of the rarities I'll cover, uh, and this is a mix of just nice birds that we've had. Uh, here's a brewer sparrow from the West that's occurred before. There was one record in the 1800s from Massachusetts. So it's just outrageous. Now there's several records of brewer sparrow. It's a frequently misidentified bird um, and tuft ID. Uh, this bird occurred and sang. So there was even a tougher case here of those northernmost yellow part of that line is what's called timberline sparrow. 
and a different distinctive subspecies. So we wondered which one is it? And Lyle Brinker has a picture. Listen carefully, you'll hear it sing. It's almost a canary-like song. Not that. Not that. There. So uh, from that recording, I'm not showing it here. Well, I have it on the left there of that actual recording. And then here, the songs of these two subspecies differ. So I was able to determine that uh, the bird that was on my Higan matched the nominant brewery, the Great Basin breeding birds. Um, also looked at specimens. It's an interesting problem still how to identify them and comparing the Massachusetts bird uh, see if we could tell the subspecies. The thickness of the crown streaking is probably one of the most distinctive things. There are size differences if you have a specimen, but the very broad black streaking on the left-hand timberline sparrows and the ground color is grayer, uh, but no firm records of those yet. Tufted puffins, some people, anybody see this bird in this group? No. So, uh, we had this record in 2014, there bounced around a few islands. Maybe it was a Machia, Machia seal island. Uh, here you can see the arrow pointing to the black body. <laughs> if you were on a boat, that's how it might appear. Um, and then a photo by Derlin Ingersoll, the bird flying around. Derlin's from New Brunswick. Um, this caused us to look back at uh, Audubon's old record. There is a specimen and we found the specimen associated with this report from the 1830s. Um, since we reviewed that and since that time, a lot of, uh, say, dirt about Audubon, not that he was a slaveholder, there's that, but that he, um, he maybe embellished some of what he had. Uh, as a person working at the, uh, in Pennsylvania who's done a lot of work, uh, historical evidence of uh, diaries and things. So I don't know. Uh, Maybe it will have to go back as unknown. It was pretty sketchy to begin with, but it was said to have been collected in Maine. Um, there was an interesting aspect, a debated thing. If you look at that toe on the inner toe, how it's curled and turned to the side, somebody said, well, that's not right. The specimen doesn't show that. Well, what happened is the preparator didn't realize that's the normal angle for the toe on a puffin. If you look at them, they have this side angled toenail. And so the preparator just turned it and made it straight up and down. Here's some pictures of the bird in last year. So it showed up and visited four different islands. And in the bottom is a video we got submitted to the records committee from uh, Machaya Seal. Pretty cool. Um, Throwing in some of the rarities, there's like three records of this now for the state. There was in, in the middle of nowhere, Piscataquis County. Well, I shouldn't say she's in the <laughs> middle of nowhere. She's had Golden Crown Sparrow and Lesser Goldfinch in her yard. Uh, but uh, I was lucky to get up there living close enough to see this male. And it was singing uh, and pretty interesting bird. So here's the distribution of Lesser Goldfinch. You can see not supposed to be in Maine. Um, probably all remember the surf bird that stuck around for a while. My photo of the bird at Biddeford. This is outrageous because it's a Pacific Coast bird, winters in Chile, but it's a very long distance migrant. And there, there were a few records. Uh, there's one fall record from uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, so on uh, Western Pennsylvania. And there was one previous Atlantic Coast record, but just the Atlantic Coast of South Florida. So. It was pretty remarkable to have this show up in Maine. And there's the distribution, normal distribution. So you can see, but long distance migrant. And then I put this under the unobtable, but shorebirds, they fly long distances. Great knot should be a bird that migrates from Northeast Asia to Australia in the winter. Uh, and Keenan Yakula found this breeding plumage bird. It's an endangered species. There's several thousand, but it's still quite rare. Um, you can see some of the similarities to surf bird actually in the spotting on the underparts. And this bird is closely related to surf bird. And in fact, there actually is a hybrid surf knot, we call it, that showed up in California. Uh, 
and on the left is a, a photo of the gray-tailed tattler that flew over Earl Johnson. He heard a bird calling. It wasn't quite right. He thought it, it sounded like a golden plover, our, our American golden plover. And he looked up and took a pictures of this bet going over and we were able to figure out, yep, that's a gray-tailed tattler. So and now a few records of that in the Northeast. Violet green swallows. So and now we're gonna to get to April. Something to think about. This was 14th of April out in Bar uh, Harbor. Uh, some of my bad digit picked video of the bird, but documentation nevertheless. Uh, Jeff Cherry found 19th of April. 2017 field fair first record for Maine and still the only record for Maine. Um, I don't know how you would have felt if like the Red Wing there was one found and then there was another long staying one but um, field fair there's an old record from Connecticut in the 1800s and I tracked down the specimen it was at the Field Museum in Chicago uh, long sort of suppressed as a possible escapee but it too was in April so it fit the pattern mm -hmm. That ultimately came and field fairs, their distribution changed starting in the 1930s. There were more and more records of them into Northeastern North America and, it, and they spread across Europe more, the populations increased. So more and more across uh, into North America, especially into the 70s and 80s on. And now they're uh, almost annual somewhere in the Northeast. Now, ending of the talk here uh, that you advertised, the Vermilion Flycatcher. And I thought I would, uh, I'll show you my video, but I also wanted to go by the timeline. And, and so uh, in one of the understatements of all time, Juanita, our dear Juanita Rushdie sends out a message, rarity in Bremen, <laughs> <laughs> and then puts in the head body of the text, Vermilion Flycatcher. Eventually, you know, you probably wouldn't read that message, but Doug did. And he might have just been speeding. He got up to uh, the Todd Wildlife Sanctuary at 2.20. It was fogged in. Couldn't see more than 300 feet. You couldn't see Hog Island. The fog starts to clear. And he spots it at 3.15. And it, I measured it 380 meters out to the house where I'm videotaping here from the shore. And uh, so we're always down at the shore of Todd. If you've ever been to the and looking across at the houses at Hog Island. Um, and then I arrived just about you know, a few minutes later and he's got the bird, he's on the bird. And Josh and Jenny Fecto arrive, Nathan Hall arrives. Um, and by 427, it flies over the back of that house and we could feel this cold Northwest wind and the temperature was dropping and that bird just went behind that building and never came back out. So I'm sad to say, Dennis, you were among those arriving with Juanita just a little bit too late. So here's my great bird. It was a great bird. Here's my digipix of the bird called Heat Haze. You see the tail pumping? Vermilion flycatcher. It's a little yellower. But how did we discover this? Well, here's the video of that. <laughs> And it was the Osprey cam out there on Hog Island. And, um, a person in the UK who was monitoring the Osprey cameras noticed this and then alerted people in America. Wow. So this whole chain of events is taking place, you know, at different time zones. And where is this bird? So this is on YouTube. I, I just... Um, I've got that running from YouTube there. Pretty cute little bird. Something going on there. So one of the things about vermilion flycatcher, like I've talked about brewer sparrow and different subspecies and different subspecies of fox sparrow and uh, dunlin, that arctica dunlin is probably a good split, isn't it? But the same thing is happening with Vermilion Flycatcher. Um, Juanita just said on Zoom, it looked just like this from the mainland, a little brilliant red dot. Yes, that's <laughs> what it was, it was a brilliant red dot. That's about all we saw from that distance, 1,200 feet. Um, 
So the big question here was, it was a spring occurrence, April, and I'm highlighting the last few rarities for April to get you all prime. Um, but there are a number of Northeast records of Vermilion flycatcher, but they're fall records of immatures to the Northeast, not these spring records. So there was one previous spring record and it was on uh, Isle Hope and there's a good description of it. And it long just been thought, well, we can't do anything with that. The site records are difficult, it's a description, but it was a very good one. Then getting this bird also in spring, got us charged up about looking at that pattern. And there's one other record from Delaware in May. Um, so the question is like the fork tail flycatcher I showed you, there is this population in green in Southern South America, the nominant Rubinus, our uh, so-called Ruby or Scarlet flycatcher. And they are austral migrants moving northward in their, uh, which would be our spring, they'd be moving north. So can you tell those apart? The answer is no, you can't. I asked a friend, Alvaro Jeremio, can you tell these apart by looking at them? He said, doesn't know how, but the songs slightly differ. Well, we weren't gonna be recording any song. <laughs> so if these do split, we'll end up having a slash on our main list. Um, but that's the potential of that. So, What's the next new bird? Um, that's another talk. There's lots of people come up with a list of what we might see, but you just really never know until you're out there looking. So with that, I'm into the talk and yeah, any questions? questions? Thank you so much. Yeah. So what is your prediction for the next? <laughs> <laughs> I stay out of that. Yeah, I, I, I mostly stayed out of that game. There are people who do it, uh, I won't, but you can find those. Um, it's it's hard to it's hard to say. You know, it's fun to predict. One of the things I would I like to look at what's the stealth things we're not thinking about, and some of those would be um, looking at what's occurred in the Caribbean, for example. Um, uh, uh, well, I've seen a black swift, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a common swift with Bob Ridgely in Pennsylvania. It was just like a spring morning and all these swifts and coming down. would have never thought something like that, but there are records for Bermuda. Um, and so that's an example. There was one that's left as Apa Spug, I think from Martha's Vineyard, uh, Alan Keith had. Um, and uh, oh, Spotted Rail is another one that on the move that would look a lot like a, maybe a Sora. Um, I didn't show it, uh, but I'll say it. Uh, another Doug Hitchcock was very embarrassed, but he would put a photograph in eBird of uh, Sora and Luke Seitz, who's always going through and identifying these things, noticed that's no Sora, that's a corn crake. So <laughs> first record in 127 years. <laughs> That's an example of increasing populations. There were there was a little period there where corn crake came back in the 1800s. They were over here, many specimens of corn crake, um, and so they started to come back through management. I think that's kind of faded off. So there was another one like on Long Island, uh, a couple in Newfoundland. So um, that's not a new one for Maine. I think spotted towhee, uh, black-tailed gull. Those are, you know, more expected. Neotropic cormorants, one I'm always looking for. That's expected there on the on the move. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's just a grab bag of things. But I'm thinking of more of the gems that people aren't thinking of. Um, could a Eurasian spoonbill or some of those herons? You know, we we'll get little egrets came over across that gap between West Africa and South America. A lot of birds have made that purple heron. Squawko heron, um, so who knows? And then once they're in the new world, they go up north and south. So uh, some of our shorebirds are in that class. Any other questions? Uh, Tom Hayward on Zoom has a question. Um, he asks, is the Jonathan Stanton collection of mounted birds from the early 1900s in Maine used in rare bird research? It is housed in Augusta in the annex. You know, I, I don't know that I've 
specifically looked at that collection. I have been in that in the collections there, um, but there are not a lot of rarities in there. But we, yeah, they're still needing some organization, and um, we've gone specifically looking, for example, the the gold plover. Um, Don Mayers and I have gone through, but I don't know that collection specifically. No. I have a question. Yeah. How, like, what is the, where do you draw the line of like believability? Like if someone like describes something really well, like, I don't know, they could have just made it up <laughs> or I don't know, their photo could have been taken somewhere else. No, it's a really good question, Julia. And uh, it's tough. I mean, there is in some sense, I let the G to speak for itself. So. I, I try to remind people that really the only thing you can be sure of is something where there's independently verifiable evidence. Okay, so what does that mean? It means like you have a photo or a specimen that somebody else doesn't know you can go and critically evaluate the identification and come to the same conclusion. So that means it has to be a definitive image of something. So there's that class. We have a lot of site records. That's the part of where records committees are keeping all these descriptive evidence. And yeah, a good description and the circumstances, did other people see it independently and identify it? Those help a lot. Single person site records become the toughest to deal with. Um, really try to avoid the, uh, the person's known ability or reputation, because I know that especially now with eBird and people submitting photos, that almost everybody who's even expert longtime birders, tens of years are making mistakes that you just couldn't believe would happen. So um, the other side of that is, and I noticed this, it's kind of a human behavior instinct. I think I mentioned it a little bit, but I noticed it in a class I was teaching with ornithology. I have them working on keeping notes and then they have to identify their a practical, so they do like this, a slideshow. What's this bird and why did you identify it? So some of it, I had a raven and some said American crow, note the squared off tail when the photo is clearly showing this wedge shaped hit. So it's like you, yeah. you imbue, you, you know what you're supposed to say and you write that down. And I see that a lot in eBird. So I get a bias against that, I guess. It's as a weaker element. So the stronger your description, the time you spend <clears throat> doing that, more information and little characters. You can often tell when somebody's really studying a bird and they, they bring up. So that's maybe that helps yeah. you understand. But yeah, site records are in a way we almost want to set them uh, with an Category. S because they, you can't really know. And the thing about site record is I like testable hypotheses. It's not testable. You can't go back and independently look at what they said they saw. Mm -hmm. So it's a different class, but we like to keep the records. I don't, yeah. I don't want to be biased on the other side, too conservative and too skeptical. I'm open-minded about that. Right. So. Um, well, Juanita also said, what is loved it in the memories this brings back. Thanks, Willis. Hi, Juanita. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Missing you. And Linda Powell says, great presentation. Thank you so much, Willis. Hi, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> and Ann Jackson, I don't know if you know her, but she says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, All right. And also asks, what is the website that you mentioned to look up those lists? You oh, uh, yeah. I if, type it out. Yeah, it's, hmm, I have the link to it what? there. It's, if you were just type in uh, and Google mm -hmm. Maine Bird Records Committee, it'll come up. Uh, where was that long list there? Now it'll go. Is get, it on sites.google.com? Yeah, that's yeah, it. Okay, I'll put that, the link in the chat for all the Zoom folks. Um, there, looks like that. Yeah, and have to send them that, it's too okay, long. Yeah, just send them the link. Yeah, and if you if you can see this now, I mean, now that I've got it on the screen. So if you go to this site, um, it tells about our committee and who's on it. 
Uh, it has the past meetings and decisions we've made there. It has all the reports. So if you click on that link, there's a, a link to the reports and you can go download a, uh, that. There's also a good part of this is this literature link that I've put up here. I was hoping to expand this more. I haven't had the time to do that as much, but on here are archived main bird notes, which was an ephemeral journal, but well kept by Jody Dupre and uh, Jeff Wells and Peter Vickery and Lyle Brinker. There's main bird life, which preceded it. And there's a couple others I'd like to get in this category. The, they're sort of ephemera of journals that have a lot of reports. And then here is a link to the uh, Biodiversity Heritage Library for uh, everybody can look at Palmer's Birds of Maine. You can go back and look at Aura Knight's uh, Birds of Maine. Um, there's a link to the early journal of the Maine Ornithological Society, which actually had, uh, was ha and Waterville at Colby for a while. <laughs> and then there's uh, links to North American birds. Uh, there's a lot of bird journals at where I've linked here at Sora. Uh, if you look up Sora, uh, maybe this will even link to it. Uh, yeah, Searchable Ornithological Research Archive. Mm. It's sora.unm.edu. So if you're ever interested in looking at some of these old journals, they've tried to scan and collect. I use this a lot um, in research. So that's a really useful site. Anyway, so that's there. Now getting back to the main question. So if you go back to the official list, here's our official list. You can download a PDF. Uh, it gets out of sync more often than the body here because it takes a lot of time to create the PDF and keep it up to date. Mm -hmm. um, at the upper right, you can then go down alphabetical scroll of everything that We've got some record of, uh, it's not every species and the status and distribution. It'd be nice to have that eventually, but you can go and click on any species here and see historical records. So here's what's going on with the Buicks wren uh, that we've not accepted. Uh, it's gonna show spotted toey as another example. So you click there and then I have links in the spotted toey. There's to I found an archive of the Bar Harbor Times, and you can see that's the only description of the spotted toey we have, and it doesn't really even say anything about it. Um, so that's, and then there's little hy hyperlinks to all the records, and you get into any one, you can see a list of records. Here's pink-footed goose, and they've exploded a number of those. Yes? How do you deal with some of the hybrids? Rare. Yeah, a lot of birds hybridize more than we know. So uh, like a current problem is white-faced and glossy ibis, and there are hybrids there. There's good white-faced ibis, but we've seen hybrids here in Maine. They're, they're obviously interbreeding. Little egret and snow egret, we're pretty sure they've hybridized too, and we've got offspring here in Maine. It's just looking to see if there's, it's difficult because Usually there's an intermediate character, but not always. Uh, and in the glossy ibis, white-faced ibis, the genetics show that uh, the genes are well dispersed throughout North America now of the invading glossy ibis, uh, invaded North America. And um, so you can't really tell from genetics what, what its phenotype is gonna be. Uh, the Nelson sparrows and uh, Solmar sarp sparrows they look like the parental species, but a lot of them are actual uh, in a F2 generation or intermixed. So um, golden wing warbler is another one that's difficult. Um, but there's a, a point at which, you know, how, how much influence can there be? There was a recent case in California of a perfect phenotypically pure uh, eastern towhee, our towhee, with the white spot in the wing and saw no all black back. And it gave calls of both, well, I debated this, but it gave calls of both Eastern Toei and this sort of intermediate call of a spotted Cree call. And I looked through uh, the zone of hybridization in the Eastern part of the Midwest. 
And the birds there that are identified as pure eastern towhees give this intermediate call. So they may be carrying over some of that. Calls are thought to be innate and genetically passed, not learned, but they may also learn those calls. So we don't know. So, you know, it's just all looking at all the characters you can to try to sort this out. But it is a it is a problem. And I, I think reporting hybrids is really super useful. And there's a lot of categories to do that. The library's so. closing in three minutes. Oh boy, so. we got to get out of here. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs>